Good morning. Good morning. Hanging out with comedians in this church, you guys will appreciate this thought. I'm sitting here standing full, staring at a basket of rocks. Okay? And my first thought was to pass them out early in the service. But this is Delco. You know, I don't want you voting. With, with what you should be casting upon yourself. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, you'll learn. <laughs> yes, yes. Things that you've learned 20 years living in Delco, you know, in ministry. Um, Rosh Hashanah represents new beginnings. Now, only in Gulf. Technically, you get a mulligan. I tried that once in miniature golf with my wife and some of her friends. I didn't get my mulligan. <laughs> I said, but it's golf. No, it's not. I found out that there is a form of golf called cutthroat. Mm -hmm. you know? um, or I took a youth group one time to the place over in Clifton Heights that had four miniature golf courses all lined up in a row. And they discovered that they could play a tack golf, like croquet, mm -hmm. where if they didn't like somebody's shot, they could pitch it to the next course over, and they would all move over to the next course. <laughs> I was like, oh, Lord, please, mm -hmm. let's not get thrown out of here. Um, but new beginnings. You know, this the Rosh Hashanah only shows up one time. It's in Ezekiel 40, verse 1. And the Hebrew word has a two-part meaning. Rosh means head. Hashanah means the year. So it's ahead of the year. Now, it always precedes Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which Gordon will eloquently be speaking on next week. But it's a preparation. It's a preparation where you do your heart check before you go to God, where you, as we saw last week in the beginning of the study, you go and you start making amends with people. You know, before you can make amends with God for that year, which you did or didn't do, you need to be making things right with others. Out of that comes the, the concept of mitzvah. Now, a mitzvah is something that goes back to Abraham, where God gave him a commandment. Well, the commandment is that we should bless others. We should meet needs. We should be able to care about other people, write a check, serve, use our gifts. And this particular time period prior to... Yom Kippur is the time when in the Jewish culture, many people do their major giving. It's also a sweetness, as I spoke about the apples on the table. A traditional thing that you will have on Rosh Hashanah are sliced apples dipped in honey. And it's to remind you that taste, that sweetness is to remind you spiritually of Good things have God done in your life. How has he blessed you? How has he met needs? How has he changed you? So while you're sitting there dipping and noshing on those apples, you can have a little self-conversation -con -con about your life. So we're looking at a reboot. Now listen... We're not, we're not sitting here saying this morning that the Rosh Hashanah is January 1st, a physical calendar New Year. It's not. It's a spiritual one, which I personally think is more important. I love the fact that it's in the fall. And if you look at um, Zimmerman's book on the biblical feast, you have Rosh Hashanah leading into Yom Kippur, and 10 days later you leave into Sukkot, Jewish Thanksgiving. So we have this preparation, we reflect, we, we pause, we, we cleanse, we think about our lives, and we lead into that day, the holiest day of the year in the Jewish calendar, where we are mentally, physically, spiritually right with God. And then for the next week, we celebrate outside in our little sukkah, having our burgers without cheese, 
and we stare at the sky, and we tell stories, and we do the pouring of the water out, the presence of the Holy Spirit being poured out into our midst, celebrating and thankful for all that God has done. And the cool thing about Sukkot is you build your little, your little tent-like structure with the open sky, and you stare at the sky and the stars, and you tell stories at night. Uh, you gather for a week at night, and you always leave a chair empty for the immigrant, for the stranger, for the presence of God. That's what it's all about. And you say you're a Gentile. Yeah, I'm a Goya pastor. I do have Jewish roots in my, in my blood. Not so much that I can point back and say, that person was Jewish in my life. But according to my DNA, it's there. We need this. We need this. God said that by having grafted you Gentiles into the family, Jesus was Jewish. His disciples were Jews. Paul was Jewish. The first church was Jewish. The Gentiles were welcomed into this Jewish community. These principles, these foundational things were there for them to enjoy and us to enjoy as well. Because we need the balance that these things talk about in our lives. Listen, we're too busy. I made a choice to be bivocational to pastor here. I work a stressful job. I dispatch police and fire. I do ministry. I started a ministry because I saw a great need. I raised money for that need. I've been a dad to eight kids that weren't mine. Two became mine. I've been a husband for 41 years. It's a lot. It's a lot. Really. I've made a lot of choices. There are times I've worn six hats during the week. And here's the thing, when you look at this, this, this structure of the feast, and I think this is quite possibly one of the most important things that I'm going to say this morning, God has planned in his calendar for your exhaustion. God has planned in his calendar for your stupidity and your arrogance. He has. He's got your back. Daddy will take care of you. You've got to start realizing that, that God... <laughs> in his ebb and flow of our yearly lives, that God has provided a way, not only to the cross, but how to survive during the week. I'm going to ask for a show of hands, and not to do embarrass anybody, but with a show of hands, how many people practice Sabbath? Two. Notice the pastors in the room are not raising their hands. We're busy people. We're going constantly. My day off is Monday. You don't want to know what I do on my day off on Monday. I work until I drop. Because my Monday is my catch-up day. Shame on me. Listen. Just as God has provided this renewal, this, this new beginning that he gives us on an annual basis where we can stop, pause, reflect, meditate, have a conversation with ourselves. Have a conversation with him. Have an R-rated conversation with him because we're trying to work stuff out in our lives and then repent and then move on. The Bible says that we are supposed to take Sabbath every single week. We're supposed to have that time we set ourselves apart to be with him, to shut down. I know some guys that only do it for a couple hours. I'm trying to do that. I like to work it up to it's a half day where I don't take calls. You know, being in ministry is, please don't take this the wrong way. Being in ministry, even if you are a volunteer working in ministry, there's thing, the thing called managing the interruptions. It just is. Because people matter. Lives matter. Situations matter. But if we don't practice spiritual self-care, we will burn out. 70% of all pastors that are in ministry today within five years will not be in ministry because they will have burned themselves out. It's critical. It's critical. Take what you learned today and then do a greater study on how you can carve out some time every single week to meditate, to worship, to get away, 
to go for a walk in the woods. Whatever, whatever God leads you to do, you need to be practicing the self-care or you will burn yourself out spiritually, which will wipe everything else out that you do. little introduction. <laughs> Setting the table for what I call a pocket full of rocks. Air Joy and I went down to the river yesterday, creek, and I grabbed a pocket full of rocks and I videotaped doing this. One of the great traditions, and by the way, you notice that we have not blown the trumpet today. <laughs> The reason why I don't blow the trumpet like everybody else does is because there's these components that are as important as blow. If we just blow a trumpet, it's like, oh, we blew a trumpet, celebrated Jesus, yay! Where's the practicality in it? There's all this stuff that's rich that we need to be incorporating into our lives. That if we don't, we're toast. So you grab a pocket full of rocks and you go down to a body of water, a running stream. Preferably with fish in it, because there's a picture here that we're going to get to. And you take the rock, the rocks, and you say prayers, and you read scripture, and as you work through it, you cast one stone at a time into the water, symbolically giving that issue to God. This is powerful stuff. You know, it is that, it's that textural, you're holding a stone, you know? You got dirt in your pocket that you got to shake out, picturing of the sin that you're trying to get rid of in your life. You know, we all have it, you know. I mean, I, 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 very, very early on, I was shocked that I still sinned after I came to Christ. I was like, my, 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 uh, my, my uh, discipler, uh, Ennis Pepper, who's now been in South Africa as a pastor for 32 years, he was up here a few months ago. We had dinner, he and Becky and Joy and I. And... Uh, we were laughing one day at uh, my sorry attitude. I was so depressed that I was still a sinner. He's like, well, God saved you. It isn't like you accept Christ and go, poof, you're in heaven. You know, you, you'd all wish the immediate rapture singularly once at a time. You know, I came to Christ and now poof, I'm perfect. Yay. No, it's transformational. So we have these rocks. We go to a body of water and one at a time. Therapeutically, you work through this relationship with Christ and you cast these stones into the water. And I want you to know, from the beginning to the end, you start feeling a little different because of the reminder, the heart connection that you have. There's an old, old, old song that I couldn't find or we'd be singing it this morning, it says this, down by the riverside, going to lay my burden down by the riverside, going to throw my sins away down by the riverside, going to know I'm forgiven down by the riverside. It's a, it's a Negro spiritual. Talking about this practice out of, the, out of the Jewish culture, of all things. Amazing. And by the way, it's called Tashnik. Sounds like I'm speaking Klingon, mm -hmm. you know? But Tashlik means to cast away. The greatest part of a new beginning is that you have the opportunity to cast away the sin in your life. The stuff that is built up in your life. The disappointments that have built up in your life. So we go. We go to the river. We remind ourselves at first like so many fish caught unaware in the net of sin. This awareness should encourage us to ask for forgiveness. Yesterday I was pitching the stones and I saw a little trout go by. And I thought about that. You know, they stock this stream with trout so people like us can catch them and eat them. You know? Sin has that way about us. It catches us. It ensnares us. It grabs a hold of us. And we need to cast it away. In Ecclesiastes 9, it says, Moreover, man does not know his time. Like a fish caught in a treacherous net, and the birds trapped in a snare. So the sons of men are ensnared in evil time, when suddenly it falls 
on them. Yep. Another passage. I'm gonna, by the way, there's going to be a lot of scripture here, so just soak it in. It'll be on the YouTube this afternoon if you want to rewatch it. If you really want to then, I can hand this to you when you walk out the door. It says, asleep, awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 11 through 14. You see, Jesus is the answer to the world today. Like no other. So we cast. We take, we fill up, you, you, the, the symbolism that you do if you have small children, you make them wear pants or a jacket with pockets, and they fill up their pockets with dusty old stones. And you walk them down to the river, and one at a time, you read out this verse, and you say, Casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5 7. We cast it because he cares about us. He, we cast it so we let go of the stuff. We cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. Psalm 55 22. Do you guys realize that God desires to sustain you? And in order to be sustained, you have to let something go. So why do we empty our pockets? We empty the dirt. We remind ourselves that we should look inside and brush away every trace of evil so that we may be free from sin. You want to take your pocket, you want to take it out and shake it to, re to remind you stuff of the stuff that's in your life that you need to shake free. Do you know the practice of farmers taking their rugs out and put them on the line and beating the snot out of them is a symbol of doing just that, of getting rid of the stuff in your life. Why do we shake our pockets? Because sins are sticky. I love that. The lady who had grandkids wrote this. Um, this is Zimmerman. Sometimes they really cling and hang on. We must throw all of them away. Again, this is a therapeutic vision, experience, textile, however you want to call it, experience where if you don't do this, you're missing out on an opportunity to physically connect. Listen, most millennials, most people that are even Gen Xers, have this fracturedness to us where... We're this multiplicity of us. There's multiple layers. We don't hear in one sound bite. We have to hear in 11 sound bites all at the same time for it, for it to be able to connect to us. And that, by the way, is exactly how the Holy Spirit speaks to you. He doesn't just come at you with one message. He comes at you with that same message 11 different ways to speak to your soul, to speak to your inner man, so that you get it. As Paul said in, in, in Scripture, he said, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. And you've got to get to that place in your life. So who's like you, God? Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. And he will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He, you will cast out all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, 18 and 19. It's powerful. I'm going to say it again. If you don't practice this kind of stuff in your life on a yearly basis, you are missing out on the richness of your heritage to be able to connect. As a Baptist pastor in Alabama once said, we're Jews too. How many of you guys remember Brian Neal? Came to Widener a number of times. He, uh, Brian's story was a really sweet story. He was a, he was a loud rocker, a guitar player. I mean loud rocker as in Marilyn Manson. He played with a lot of loud rock bands. and You know, he had the leather outfit, leather coat, the chains, 
the tats, the long stringy hair, and he had just accepted the gig to be the newest member of Marilyn Manson. And he went back to Mississippi to his grandmama's church, a little Baptist church out in the, the bayou area. And uh, just one last time, he said, I just want to visit Grandma Mama one last time before I go off with Marilyn Manson. And he walked in dressed like that. He must have been a sight, you know, the black makeup and all that kind of stuff, you know. Walked in the door, old preacher, Preacher Jimmy, gets up and preaches the gospel. And that morning, Brian comes to Christ. Never joins Marilyn Manson. Changed him radically. Um, I know Brian's struggling with cancer now, but he was here on tour nine years ago or so. We were actually doing this service. And uh, he took his stone. He goes, later this week, I'll, I'll show you what I did with it. Later in the week, he posted me some pictures. See, he was on tour out west. We were the starting point of the tour, and a week later, he was, oh, the Grand Canyon. And he was on the rim of the Grand Canyon, and he had fistful of stones, and one at a time, pitched it into the Grand Canyon. There are hikers down there. Yes, well, I, did, I didn't think about that until now, but he did that. And I'm sure God didn't let him hit it. The verse that he shared with me, I'm going to share with you now. It's this. See how far you can throw it. For as far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. And every time I hear that first verse, I think of Brian, and I think of the picture of the Grand Canyon, where it's the, the, the donkey trail, the little wooden railing thing, and he's sitting there going, that's so cool. You see, Jesus is our solution. This whole thing points to him. Are we drawing from him what we need? Are we thirsting? Are we pursuing after righteousness? Are we adding to our faith? Not that it's going to save us even more, but the fact of the matter is that, yes, we are saved, but yes, we are in process of transformation from the inside out. The old man, yes, has passed away, but many times our own personal life, our own personal body, has gotten to this place of our spiritual experience where we have forgotten the fact that we are a new man in Christ, that we are this new creature. Because the old stuff, you know, it's like, it's like having a bad sock puppet that every once in a while shows up and wants to talk to you. Just so. One of my favorite, one of my favorite online YouTube people are the, uh, the Scottish falsetto sock puppets. Yes, they're crude and rude, but it reminds me of the first time I, I saw it, I'm like, he's arguing with himself. How many times do you and I do that? You know, we, we, we are spiritual beings that were designed by God to have a relationship with Him. And so many times, we are arguing with ourselves while God is watching, and He's trying to have a conversation with us. And you're going, excuse me, I'm talking here. And you turn and you're talking to your left, right hand, you know? I mean, we are just that way. And the simple matter of fact that Jesus is the answer. Acts 5 says, Then with mighty power God exalted him to be the prince and savior, so that the people of Israel would have an opportunity for repentance and for their sins to be forgiven. There are two things that you and I live for. Two things only. There are two things that are more important than anything else that we will ever do. And we get those two things. We would not be arguing on Facebook about who should be president. Or we should care. Thing number one. What have you done with Jesus? Have you accepted him? Is he your Lord? Are you in a relationship with him? That's number one. And number two. Who are you taking with you? The only thing that's going to matter, friends, in a hundred years is who did you take with you? My mom's going to be there. My grandpapa's going to be there. I have a few family members that I know is not going to be there because they told, told me and Jesus to take a long walk on short pier on a deathbed. 
which broke my heart. I remember my mom. My mom was this throwback to the 50s. She'd wear the dress. She'd wear the little hat to church. She'd wear the white gloves. You know, I was a worship leader at a fairly substantial church, and I'm, I'm up there with the worship team, and I'm looking down. There's my mom with her little gaggle of, of little old blue-haired ladies, and she's showing pictures, and I'm going, dear God, she's showing my naked baby pictures. You know, and that's just how my mom was. My mom was ornery and contentious, you know. She was a real broad. Um, and one morning, we did an annual biker service at Darley Road, and we would have a hundred or so outlaw bikers there. One year, to the detriment of some of our older board members, one of the bikers rode his bike, his Harley, into the church and parked in the little mosh pit up front. You know, the churches should have mosh pits, by the way. Um, ours is usually back there, but we have artwork there now. But anyway, I'm sitting there in the front row with my mom. I've come down from worship, and this young man gets up. This young man gets up, and he starts sharing his testimony about how he came to Christ and how he fought God, and how that he was one of the few people that had ever laid his bike down going 60 miles an hour on I-95 and lived. See, his bike rolled on 95. And he had those metal walkers with the little thing, you know? You see, he had worked, and I appreciate this because I've had to go through the same thing, learning to walk again, and he stood. And he said, you know, I'm not in a wheelchair anymore, and you don't have to fight God like I fought, fought God. But some of you who have fought God for a long, long time, and if you're ready to give up and start getting serious with God, I want you to pray out loud with me right now. And he started praying this prayer, inviting people to invite Christ into their heart. And my my 68-year-old mom is sitting beside me, little white gloves, little white Bible on her lap. You know, she worked for the bishop. She had been involved in church her entire life, and she's praying out loud, inviting Jesus into her heart. She was never the same again. Completely different countenance. Something else that was really bizarre that morning, I am having a very weird conversation with God. And I'm sitting there, you know, I had been saved at that point in time for 22 years. And had this kind of relationship with my mom, you know, about spiritual things. And I'm sitting there, and I, I remember the conversation. I look up to heaven and I'm going, a biker service. Really? A biker service? <laughs> you know, I'm having this, and she's praying out loud this whole time. Psalm 18, 118 says, Then with mighty power, well, excuse me, in my distress I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. For he is for me. How can I be afraid? What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side. He will help me. He will let those who hate me beware. For it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. It is better to take refuge in him than in the mightiest king. So overflowing is his kindness towards us that he took away our sins through the blood of his Son by whom we are saved in Ephesians 1 7. I blotted out your sins. They are gone like the morning mist at noon. O oh, return to me, for I have paid the price to set you free. Isaiah 4. Those who have lived with Christ for a long time will struggle from time to time with doubt. We will struggle with the sins that have encapsulated us or put us back in bondage or handcuffs. We need to be reminded that our sins have been scattered as far as the East is from the West. We need to be reminded that He's blotted out our sins. As I said last week, in the Holy of Holies, there's a, there's a box called the Ark of the Covenant. And in there, in the box is the wall. Represents the wall. There's two, there's two angels looking down at the lid of the box. Looking at the lid into the box where the wall is. And the high priest will pour the blood of the lamb out over the top of that box. And those angels who represent God himself looking down at the wall looks at the blood. 
How does God see you if you're saved? He sees you as if you never sinned. Because he's looking at you through the ultimate payment. Grab a rock. Go to some running water and grab a few more rocks. Because if you're like me, one rock will not be enough. Remind yourself of where you stand in Christ. Remind yourself about the relationship that you have. For you students, you happen to have a couple of pretty substantial creeks running through your campus. So you don't have to wander too far. Practice this annually. It will change you. It will keep you in balance. And if you've never prayed that prayer, if you've never finalize that relationship with Christ, do so today. Don't wait, just do it. Don't dawdle, just do it. Don't fight God, just do it. You'll be the happiest person on the face of the planet. I know I was when I changed. When I changed directions when I decided to live for Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sweetness of this relationship that we have with you. We thank you that you have put these mechanisms into our life, whether it's a weekly Sabbath or a, a, a manging on, on apples with honey to remind us of the sweetness to Father where we can cast these stones away once a year to remind ourselves we have a spiritual new year where old things are passed away and all things have become new. That Lord, if there be anybody either watching or here in person today that has not prayed the prayer, that today would be the day that would hearken your voice. Change us. Have your way with us. Lord, we want to live for you. We want to be productive. We just ask this now in your son's name.